Hello and welcome to this contact webinar. Um, if you have any technical hitches, please bear with us. And those of you who are joining by PC, laptop, tablet or smartphone should now be able to see this introduction slide and hopefully hear my voice. My name is Alex Grady. I'm an Education Development Officer for NASEN. NASEN is the National Association for Special Educational Needs. Um, we're a charity, we've been around for 27 years, and our main role is to support all professionals who work with children and young people with SEND. So we have lots of SENCOs, lots of um, class teachers, early years practitioners, people in FE, SEN advisors and consultants, etc., in our membership. My background is as a teacher. I was an SEN teacher for 25 years in various different um, guises as a primary teacher, SENCO. Um, I've worked in a special school and I've worked in a range of different resource provisions for children with lots of different kinds of special educational needs and disabilities. So I hope you um, enjoy this webinar today. You will have opportunity to ask questions. You can do that by using the question icon on the toolbar, which you should be able to see on your screen. And you type your question into the box, that will go through to our administrator, and then she will put those questions through to me, and I will aim to answer as many of those as I can at the end of the webinar. Okay, so the key questions that I'm hoping that this webinar will address today are, first of all, what is the SEND legislation? And what does it mean for your children? How do schools identify and support pupils with SEND? And how should parents be involved in this process? Okay. If you have questions at any time, you can type them in whenever it occurs to you, but I will actually answer them at the end of the webinar. I do just want to say at this point that I won't be able to answer specific questions about your individual children and young people because obviously I don't know them, I don't have the background information, etc. But I will certainly do my best to answer more general questions. Okay, so let's have a look at the SEND legislation. The first piece of legislation is one that you may well already be aware of, and that's called the Equality Act, which was um produced in 2010. Now under the Equality Act, disability is what's called a protected characteristic. And disability, the definition that's used of that is actually much broader than many people realise. So things like um, autism, dyslexia, ADHD, etc. are actually classed as disabilities under the Equality Act. And there are certain requirements for schools under this act regarding pupils with disabilities. First of all, um, the act states that discrimination, harassment and victimisation are outlawed. That the act covers both current and prospective pupils and that's quite an interesting um, aspect I think because it means that schools have to consider the Equality Act when they're looking at admissions to their school as well as pupils who are currently in the school. So they, they have to treat children who are applying to that school with disabilities equally uh, and not show any discrimination, harassment or victimisation etc. The governing body of the school is responsible for the um, implementation of the Equality Act that is obviously delegated to the head teacher and staff of the school, but the governing body does have the ultimate responsibility. There is a requirement to make what's called reasonable adjustments, and this is um, one of the main features of the Act, actually. We're going to have a, a look at what some of these reasonable adjustments might be a little bit later on. But it basically means that all public bodies, including schools, have to make the changes to meet the needs of people with disabilities and the other protected characteristics. The, the, the word reasonable is used in a legal sense and um, it means what the man or woman on the street would consider to be reasonable. So it has to be, um, perhaps, let me try and give you an example, uh, it perhaps would be unreasonable to put a lift into a two-storey two building to accommodate a child with a walking frame. 
but it would not be unreasonable for that child to have their classroom downstairs so that they could access it easily. So a reasonable adjustment would be to make sure that that child's classroom is always on the ground floor, for example. These duties are anticipatory. So we, are, we can't just wait for somebody to um, fail, as it were, and, and, and you know, to struggle to, to, to find that their classroom is upstairs and they can't get up the stairs, using the previous example. We need to anticipate those needs in advance and put those adjustments in place. And under the Equality Act, it's also possible to take what's called positive action. So it is possible to treat um, pupils with disabilities better than other pupils in order to reduce the potential inequality there. Okay. Right, the second important piece of legislation for SEND is called the Children and Families Act of 2014. And this is the piece of legislation upon which the SEND Code of Practice which we'll talk about in a moment, is actually based. So this is a key piece of legislation and it places the child or young person very squarely at the centre of all decision making at every level. And the core principles are that local authorities must pay particular attention to the views, wishes and feelings of children and their parents and young people. They must pay attention to the importance of children, parents and their young people participating as fully as possible in decision making and providing the information and support to enable them to do so. And to supporting children and young people's development and helping them to achieve the best possible educational and other outcomes. So those principles are all enshrined in law within the Children and Families Act. And then we come to the SCND Code of Practice, which is the statutory guidance for the Children and Families Act. OK, so the SCND Code of Practice isn't a piece of legislation itself, but it is statutory guidance. So all state funded schools must have regard to this, as must the local authorities, special schools, FE and sixth form colleges, people referral units early years providers that receive funded places, the NHS and clinical commissioning groups. The only people that do not have to have regard to this are the independent sector, although actually most independent schools do you base their um, practice on the SEND code of practice because it's, it's actually very, very good and what it says is, is very good quality. So let's have a look at the core principles. This code of practice, which was published in 2015, changed the age range to which it um, relates. And it now relates to from naught to 25 years. So right from birth all the way through the whole of the school and education system into early adulthood, because there's a very much of an emphasis on preparing children and young people for adulthood from the very earliest days. It's very much about person-centred practice. So as the um, Children and Families Act says, it's about making sure that the children, their parents and the young people themselves are absolutely at the centre of all decision making that happens and that their views are paramount and taken into account. It emphasises the importance of early and effective identification of need. Early identification of need doesn't just mean within the early years, although obviously some needs are identified um, in the early years. It means as early as something becomes um, noticeable, uh, as soon as a need becomes apparent, that action is taken to um, meet that need. It sets out that appropriate support and provision to meet needs through what's called a graduated approach must happen. We're going to talk about the graduated approach a bit more in a moment. Um, it sets high aspirations for the outcomes for everybody. So outcomes are very, very important in the code of practice. Those outcomes should be what the child, their parents, or once they um, are older, the young person themselves, desire for themselves. So what do you aspire to for your child or what do you aspire to for yourself? And we should be working towards those outcomes right from day one. 
And the other important thing that's new in this code of practice that changed from previous ones is that um, behaviour is no longer a category of need. So it now looks at mental health more. So it talks much more about looking at the causation of what might be perceived as challenging behaviours. So not taking the behaviour as, as that's, that's the um, key thing here, but actually what is that behaviour telling us about that child's needs? What are they trying to communicate to us through their behaviour? And that's been quite an important, um, an important change under that. Now, under the code of practice, I thought it'd be useful to go through the definition of SEM. It's a slightly um, circular definition, but bear with me. And this is a quote from the code. A child or young person has SEM if they have a learning difficulty or disability, which calls for special educational provision to be made for him or her. A child of compulsory school age or a young person has a learning difficulty or disability if he or she has a significantly greater difficulty in learning than the majority of others of the same age, or has a disability which prevents or hinders him or her from making use of facilities of a kind generally provided for others of the same age in mainstream schools or mainstream post-16 institutions. So essentially, what that's saying is that it's about do we need to do something different for this child or young person? It's around, do we need to make that special educational provision? If a child is able to access what most children of their age are accessing in a mainstream environment, then they may not come under this definition. But if they are having significant difficulties accessing that, then they are likely to. And that doesn't just refer to um, academic outcomes, but it's talking about education in its broadest sense. So it should also include social, um, emotional aspects of learning as well. Okay, so let's go on to the SENCO so that you've got a clear understanding of what the SENCO is and what their role is in the school. SENCO stands for Special Educational Needs Coordinator. Most schools use that title. Some schools will say SENCO and add the D in the middle. And some schools will say something like um, Inclusion Leader, Learning Support Leader, something like that. That tends to be the case in secondary schools more. But somebody within the school must be designated as the SENCO, even if they're given a slightly different title. Now, in a mainstream school, this person must be a qualified teacher. OK, that didn't used to be the case, but it is now the case under the code of practice. So um, a teaching assistant or um, a progress mentor or somebody who's not a qualified teacher cannot be the school SENCO. And SENCOs are now expected to hold uh, the National Award for SENCO, which is a specialist postgraduate qualification. The reason I've put most is that SENCOs who've been in post for a long time are exempt from that because they have many years of experience. But anyone becoming a SENCO um, since 2009 must either already have the award or they must be working towards the award with a view to achieving that award within three years of their um, appointment to SENCO. So it's quite um, uh, an in-depth and involved qualification. It is postgraduate, it's a master's level qualification, and um, it does involve a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of commitment, but it's a very, very high quality award. Sometimes, particularly in bigger schools, the SENCO is supported by an assistant SENCO or somebody with a, with a similar title to that. And that may be a teaching assistant or another teacher, and that's absolutely fine. It's possible for the head teacher to be the SENCO because, of course, they are a qualified teacher, but it's not generally recommended because the role of the SENCO is quite significant, as is the role of the head teacher. So to try and do both um, isn't always isn't usually, to be honest, very effective. Mm 
And many, many Senkos have, in fact, I would say most Senkos have other responsibilities. So most Senkos will also be, have a class teaching responsibility or a subject teaching responsibility in a secondary school. And the role, the Senko part of their role is often part-time. Many Senkos just work on a part-time basis doing just their Senko role. So it's useful to find out what the um, situation is in your school. Okay, we'll have a look at what the responsibilities of the Senko are now. So their key responsibilities include overseeing the day-to-day -day operation of the school's SEN policy. And a big part of that is coordinating provision for children with SEN. So the Senko themselves are unlikely to be the person actually delivering provision. Many years ago, that was tended to be the case. But these days, the role of the Senko is much more about strategic leadership and having an overview of what's available for children with SEN in the school as a whole. So it's very much about coordinate, coordinating that provision, making sure that all the children who have been identified as having needs are having those needs met appropriately. They will also be there to advise on the graduated approach to providing SEN support. So they'll be there for, to advise, to give advice to teachers and um, teaching assistants and other members of the senior leadership team and so on to help them meet the needs of the children that they're working with. They will also advise on deployment of the school's resources to meet needs, and that means resources in its broadest sense. So most SENCOs are responsible for the deployment of teaching assistants, which is a major resource um, within a school's budget, of course, but also things like um, physical resources, um, such as IT support, um, teaching resources, um, physical aids, that kind of thing. And they will advise as to what's the best the best approach to those resources, where should the money be spent, um, and what, what's going to have the biggest impact on the children with SEND. They are also responsible for making sure that liaison happens with parents of pupils with SEN. So a lot of that liaison, it will be appropriate to happen with the child's class teacher or their subject teacher or form teacher at secondary level. But the Senko, once the child has been identified as having SEM, then the Senko will need to make sure that that happens. But he's also quite likely to, um, sorry, I've just seen a question pop through. Oh. <laughs> he's also quite likely to be involved directly with that liaison themselves. So it's quite likely that if you go to school to um, meet your child's class teacher who um, who's identified your child as having SEN, the Senko is highly likely to be involved in that too. The Senko is responsible for liaising with external agencies, such as educational psychologists, the local authority, etc. Um, and that will include also applying for um, funding support, applying for education, health and care plans, if that's um, appropriate, and so on. An important part of the Senko's role is to ensure a smooth transition to the next stage of education. So they should be involved both when a child is moving from one class to another within the school, but particularly when there's a movement from one school to another. Because for our children with SEND, transitions can be one of the most difficult um, aspects of school, can't they? So it, it's really important that the Senko is able to provide advice, guidance, and act as a link between one school and the next. They have to ensure that all records of SEN are up to date. The uh, record keeping of SEND is quite heavy, but it's really important that we, those records are kept and are kept well and are kept in an organised manner because we often need to refer back to them and use them um, when we make further applications as time goes on. And they should be working with the head and the governors to ensure that the school meets its responsibilities under the Equality Act. As I said before, it is the governor's responsibility to do that, but they will often um, call on the Senko to support them with that. So that's the role of the Senko, but a really important message here is that every teacher is a teacher of SEND, and every teacher 
has responsibility. Okay, they no teacher can delegate all their responsibility to the Senko. The Senko is there to coordinate provision and to provide a strategic oversight and to provide advice and guidance. But each individual teacher remains responsible for the um, progress and outcomes of every child in their class or that they teach across the week. So how do schools identify and support pupils with SEND? There's very much an emphasis on early identification. And as I said earlier, that doesn't necessarily mean in the early years, but ideally, if, a need, if needs can be identified in the early years, that, that is very, very helpful because early identification has a big impact on future outcomes. But the important thing is that as soon as a need becomes apparent, that something is done about it, okay? And it can be quite challenging, I think, particularly um, if a child's need haven't, hasn't been identified before. It can be challenging for um, early years practitioners or primary school staff or, or secondary school staff, whoever it is that first notices that need, to have that initial conversation with parents. Because just because somebody's saying, I'm a little bit concerned about your child's um, progress in this area doesn't necessarily mean that they have SEND. But, so it, but it's still important that those conversations happen so I don't, needs can be identified and met as early as possible. We, we mustn't forget that actually high quality teaching is the most important thing for all children, including those children with SEND. So, once needs have been identified, actually most of those needs should be met through high quality teaching, which is well differentiated for individuals. And schools, of course, are making regular assessments anyway, um, as part of their, you know, it's their bread and butter is to assess progress. And this can feed in to what we call the graduated approach. Okay, and this is something that's introduced in the code of practice. And it follows this cycle that you can see on the screen there. And it starts with assessment. And assessment doesn't necessarily mean a formal assessment, although obviously that it may do. It could just mean that a teacher has noticed something about a child. They would then plan as to what, to, what they can do to support that child. So that child is struggling to make progress in a particular area. They need to try and do something a little bit different for that child and then so and then they do that so they actually put that into place and then that is reviewed to see how it went and for lots of children they'll have a little bit of extra help and they'll be fine they will catch up and they can just carry on with the usual work but for more for some children that review will indicate that there are still some issues and um it may be that some further investigation is needed. So let's have a bit more of an assessment. Let's look at this a little bit more deeply. That didn't work. So we need, let's try something else. Maybe we need to do something um, more individualized for that child. And again, we'd, we would plan for that. We would put it into place and review how that went and so on. And that cycle goes round and around and around for all children. But for children with SEND, it becomes more personalized and individualized as they sort of move move up that spiral if you like now under the equality act schools need to consider evidence that a pupil may have a disability and if they do what reasonable adjustments they might need to be made for them and pupils who are making less than expected progress given their age and individual circumstances may be identified as having sem now this could be characterized by progress, which is any one of these things, okay? It could be progress, which is significantly slower than that of their peers, starting from the same baseline. It could be progress, which fails to match or better the child's previous rate of progress. So there's been a, a slowing down or a stopping perhaps in their progress. It might be progress, which fails to close the attainment gap between the child and their peers. So that the gap is, is there and it's not getting any smaller. 
or progress which actually widens the attainment gap. So, so the child might be making progress, but the gap between themselves and their peers is actually getting wider. So any of those could indicate potential SEN. And it's important to recognise here that when we talk about progress, as I mentioned earlier, it's in areas other than just attainment. Okay, of course it includes attainment, but it also may include their progress with their wider development or their social needs. It doesn't just have to be limited to academic progress and attainment. So I thought it would be helpful to give a few examples for you of reasonable adjustments and the kinds of things that these might include. Now, this is um, a potentially endless list. So this is literally a handful of examples. But the kinds of things that might be included as a reasonable adjustment might be allowing a child with sensory needs to wear jogging bottoms instead of school trousers. OK, so the trousers, you know, that maybe they're a bit tight around the waist or they don't like the stiff feel of the waistband or they have problems um, with the feel of the zip or the fabric that the school trousers are made from, for example, then they should be allowed to wear jogging bottoms because that would be a reasonable adjustment for that child. It may be that a child with a hearing impairment needs to be sat at the front facing the teacher and teachers just need to make sure that that happens. Nice and simple, but that's a reasonable adjustment. It may include allowing a child with autism to enter and exit the classroom before everybody else so that they can avoid those crowded corridors and the physical contact which may cause them um, distress. It could be enabling a child with social interaction difficulties to work on their own if they prefer rather than in a pair. So if they're doing pair work or group work and a, uh, a child really, really struggles with that, they could be given the option of working on their own or perhaps working alongside um, the teacher or another adult. It could be something as simple as providing a word bank for a child with dyslexia so that they're doing some topic work, for example, in science. And so they, the teacher knows that they struggle with the spelling of some words, but they're actually really, really good at science. Let's give them a word bank so that they're, uh, they don't need to spend too much time worrying about the spelling of words. They can just copy them from that. It could include providing an, an alternative space at break times for a child with social anxiety. So where perhaps they can they are allowed to sit quietly, maybe with with a friend, with another adult or so on. So they're not forcing them to go out onto the playground if they really can't cope with that. It can be the more obvious physical um, adjustments, such as providing ramps for a child using a walking frame. But as I say, this list could go on and on and on. And there are um, many, many of these things are things which you would hope will happen in schools anyway, without without much um, necessarily conversation even being needed for that. But there are other things which you could reasonably expect a school to do if they're not um, doing it for your child. So it's, the, it's that concept of reasonableness which is important. So it, it's always worth discussing that with the school if you think there is a, an adjustment that could be made to support your child. Okay, so we've already said that high quality teaching is the most important response to all children, including those with SEND. So in terms of support, the most important person to support your child is actually the class or subject teacher. OK, they may sometimes be supported by a teaching assistant if they have access to one. But that is the most important element for supporting your child. If despite that high quality teaching, a teacher is thinking this child is still struggling a little, still hasn't quite got it, then they might think about putting an intervention in place. So that could be something like um, extra phonics practice. It could be a bit of a, a social skills group or so on. If a child's receiving an intervention, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a special educational need. OK, then maybe they just needed a little bit of extra work, a bit of extra practice, and that will be enough. But the important thing is to look at how the child responds to that intervention. So as I mentioned in the graduated approach, once that's been put in place, if there's still the progress that's desired isn't being made, 
then the class teacher should be working with the SENCO to think about whether perhaps that pupil does have SEM. And all through this process, information from parents should support and inform. OK, so hopefully you are able to have regular correspondence with class, particularly in primary schools, class teachers, uh, probably less so in secondary schools, but hopefully form tutors through parents evenings and so on, where you can discuss these things. And once a child has been identified as possibly having SEN, you should certainly be involved. You must be informed if your child is identified as having SEN. That is a requirement under the code of practice. OK, so as soon as a school starts to think your child may have a special educational need, they must tell you about that and talk to you about it and listen to your views and take that into account and so on. OK, once a child is identified, different schools have different ways of recording this, but lots of schools have something that's called an SEN register, which is simply a way of the, for the SENCO to manage the um, children that come under her jurisdiction. So she keeps a note of who is who in which class has been identified as having SEN. And the first stage of SEN identification is called SEN support. Um, so, as I say, if you're having an intervention, that doesn't necessarily mean you have SEN. But if you've had an intervention and they're still concerned, they might think perhaps there is something else going on. Or it might not even be that you've needed an intervention. It might be that the child is demonstrating something which, which gives rise to concern and that goes to the SENCO. And we're saying, actually, yes, we think this child is now um, needing SEN support because they need something more or something different to what most children their age are receiving in that mainstream setting. It's important to say that slow progress and low attainment do not necessarily mean that a child has SEM, but it may do, going back to that previous um, definition. Of course, children do develop at different rates and there are different levels of attainment within a normal distribution. So low attainment on its own is not necessarily an SEN, but if there was low attainment, then you would hope that teachers were considering why that might be the case. And at the same time, and this is something that sometimes gets forgotten, attainment in line with chronological age does not mean that there is not a learning difficulty. So a classic example would be a child with um, high achieving autism who in terms of school assessments is actually OK in inverted commas because he or she is 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 meeting their age related expectations. But actually for that child, they have the ability and the potential to make much greater progress than actually that they, they've still got an SEN. And they may have other um, characteristics as well, which are making it more difficult for them to, to achieve their full potential in learning. So just because they are achieving their age-related expectations doesn't mean that there isn't some kind of a learning difficulty there. And another important point to make is that having English as an additional language is not a special educational need. And sometimes this can be quite a confusing area, particularly if we have a child who's um, struggling with language because they may be having issues in English, but actually in their home language, they're absolutely fine and there are no issues at all. So that's simply a, an issue to do with learning English. Some children, of course, who speak English as an additional language are having difficulties in English and in their home language. And they may have SEN, but EAL itself is not a special educational need. OK, under the code of practice, it um, describes what's called the four broad areas of need. OK, and these are a useful way of identifying primary needs. But before I talk about those, it's important to be aware that this is not about labelling a child. OK, the code of practice says the purpose of identification 
is to work out what action the school needs to take not to fit a pupil into a category because actually most children will have needs that cut across more than one of these areas it's about identifying what their primary need is so what's the main thing that seems to be causing them the difficulties the first area is called communication and interaction and this will include things like autism because that's um, a disorder of communication and interaction. It will also include um, children with speech and language needs, of which there are many these days. The second area is cognition and learning. So that's cognition means thinking. So that's children who have a learning difficulty, which may be either moderate, severe, or profound and multiple. Um, or it may be a specific learning difficulty, such as dyslexia or dyscalculia. They all come under the area of cognition and learning. The third area is the one which is slightly different under this code of practice, social, emotional and mental health difficulties. So a child who is struggling with perhaps very severe anxiety or um, social issues in that they're struggling to get on with their peers uh, and they may be presenting with quite challenging behavior but why is that what's what's going on for them and is there a mental health issue that we need to be aware of and the fourth area is sensory and or physical needs so this will include things like hearing impairment visual impairment and physical impairments such as cerebral palsy for example that final category, those children tend to be identified quite early and it's usually quite clear what their needs are, whereas the other three categories, the needs tend to be identified later. Okay, so what about special educational provision? As I've said a couple of times already, high quality teaching differentiated for individual pupils is the first step in responding to pupils who have or may have SE in it and it is the most important aspect and it's what makes the biggest difference for all children so we need to get that right first but at, at SEM support so once a child has been identified the teacher and the SENCA will work together to consider all the information about a pupil to decide what provision is required this should include a discussion with the pupil when that's appropriate to their age and needs and their parents okay because as I said before once a child is identified as being at SEN support you must be involved and informed as parents at this point they should also tell you about something that's called the SEND information advice and support service often abbreviated to SENDIAS each local authority should have one of these and they are able to offer you independent um, advice. And it's really important at this point that the desired outcomes for a child are considered. It's crucial that progress is reviewed on a regular basis. So if school doesn't suggest a date to review progress, then I would make sure that you do because otherwise we don't want things to to drift on we want to be aware of how things are going on regularly i would say at least well it must be at least yearly ideally it would be termly for some children um, in some circumstances and probably more so for younger children you might want it to be more regularly than that because children change and develop so quickly so possibly half termly or even um more so that's something to discuss with the school but make sure that a date for that review is set so that it actually happens so once a pupil is identified as having SEN schools should take action to remove any barriers to learning and put effective educational provision in place following that graduated approach that we talked about before of assess plan do review okay so barriers to learning could include anything really that seems to be stopping the child from um, making progress so that might be the fact that they um, are struggling to learn to read that's a, becoming a barrier to their learning across the curriculum so they need to have extra provision in place to support them with their reading development for example 
as parents at this stage for children who are on SEM support, you should be aware of any supporting interventions. And if it's appropriate, then they should seek parental involvement to reinforce or contribute to progress at home. So that's not always appropriate, but if it is, you know, you hopefully will be able to support what's going on in school. So if, if they're trying to learn, um, I don't know, their multiplication tables, for example, can you reinforce and practice those at home? Not always appropriate, depends on what the need is, but it's something to think about and be aware about. A crucial, crucial point, the class or the subject teacher is still responsible for working with the child on a daily basis. So once the child is identified as having SEM, it means the SENCO becomes involved to offer that advice and guidance, but that class or subject teacher is still responsible for that daily provision. Sometimes it's appropriate to offer some one-to-one -one support for a child with SEM. But it's important to say that this must be really carefully planned so that the child is able to continue to develop independence in learning and self-help skills, because there's been quite a lot of research into this recently. And it's been found that for some children, too much one-to-one -to -one support actually has a negative impact on their outcomes. OK, so it's very important that if that additional support is given, whether it's by a teaching assistant or a teacher, that it fits closely with what's going on in the classroom and that the class or subject teacher themselves retains that responsibility for progress with the support of the SENCO. So it's important that whoever's offering that one to one support understands what that effective support looks like okay what we don't want is for an adult to be stepping in and doing things for your child which your child could learn to do for themselves okay it's much more about them helping their child to learn the skills that they need so that they can become more independent themselves because that's much more important for them in the long term as they get older it may be that um, the school wants to involve external agencies. OK, so it, they'll have tried things themselves within the school setting. But if progress is still not as expected, then they may consider that they need to seek advice and support from specialists external to the school. These specialists can be involved at any point. Parents must always be involved in any decision to involve specialists and usually you have to sign a form to give your consent for those people to be involved. And specialists could include educational psychologists, speech and language therapists, specialist teachers, for example, for dyslexia, hearing impairment, physical disability, etc. Special school staff, occupational therapists, etc. There are a whole range of people who are um, out there, but it varies a great deal from area to area what access schools have to these specialists. So a school is often really, really keen to get specialist um, external support, but they may be struggling to actually access that support. Uh, waiting lists can be quite long and um, some local authorities don't always employ specialist teachers for example these days so just just to be aware that it can be really very frustrating for you but also for schools to not always be able to access the um, external agencies as quickly as they would like but I have no doubt that they will be trying their best to get that support that's needed right just a, a, a brief note on education health and care plans so it may be that after following the advice and guidance from within school and from those external specialists, a child is still not making expected progress. In that case, it might be considered that an application for a health, education, health and care needs assessment is made. It is usually appropriate to complete more than one cycle of that assess, plan, do, review graduated approach before making that application. And the local authority who the application is made to will ask to see evidence of the action taken by the school as part of SEM support. 
okay so and again this does vary from local authority to local authority but they do usually say right what have you been doing so far what's worked what hasn't worked or so on before they decide to carry that out now if an education health and care plan needs assessment is carried out it may result in the education health and care plan being issued not always they may send what's called a note in lieu to say um, we don't consider that your child needs an education health and care plan but otherwise they would send through a draft plan for, for you to look at as parents an education health and care plan is usually required to access a special school placement um, but approximately 50 percent of children with education health and care plans are educated in mainstream schools I'm not going to go into huge detail about education, health and care plans now because we're very much focusing on SEM support. But I think one of the questions that I've had through is about an education, health and care plan. So I will look at that at the end. OK, thought it'd be useful to just um, highlight a couple of other things for you to be aware of. One of those is the school's SEN information report. Every school must publish on their website an SEN information report. It usually has that title. It may be called something slightly different, but you should be able to find it using that title. And this must include information about how special educational needs are identified in the school, how parents and pupils are consulted, what provision is made for SEN school in the school, and who the SENCO is. The report itself should be easily accessible to parents and young people. I th I've seen a range of these. Some are fantastic. Some are very, very wordy. There is a big range in terms of the quality and accessibility of the SEN information report. If you haven't looked at your schools, it's well worth having a look um, and giving them feedback if you think there's any improvements that, that could be made to that. What will also be included on the SEN information report is how to access what's called the, the local offer. OK, now the local offer, which is a bit of an odd name, I think, really, um, <laughs> is basically should describe what the local authority offers in terms of SEN support. OK, and local authorities must publish a local offer on their website. Again, some of these are really good, some not so much, and some are easy to find and some are not very easy to find. It should offer you information about provision for SEND within that area, including mainstream schools and special schools, but also independent schools, services, groups, charities, etc., which are relevant to children and young people with SEND. The local offer should be co-produced with parents and young people and it should be accessible and easy to use. So, as I say, they do vary a great deal in quality, but if you haven't looked at yours within your local authority, it's worth doing so. And again, as with the SEN information report, offer some feedback if, um, if you think there's any improvements that could be made to that. Local authorities tend to be reviewing these on an ongoing basis, so they are often, they are often looking for feedback on their local offer. Okay, let's have a look at how SEND is funded. Every pupil in a school receives what's to the school what's called the per pupil weighting. Okay, this is an amount of money per head for every child in that school. And this varies from one local authority to another. So you may have heard in the media recently about something called the fair funding formula or the national funding formula. Um, and the government is looking at creating more parity across the system so that there isn't so much of a variation because the variation can cause quite significant issues um, for some local authorities. But that's the money which the school uses to pay for everything that the school normally provides. So the teachers, the books, the, the, the building, the resources, etc. but maintenance of the building, that is, etc. There will also be what's called the notional SEN budget. And that at the moment is £6,000 per pupil. Now, the reason it's called notional is that it's not actually ring fenced. So there isn't a separate budget line for the SEN budget. 
okay it's part of the overall funding that's available to the school and it's based on um, a quite a complicated formula that looks at things like um, levels of disadvantage low prior retainment um, etc it's, it's, it's quite complicated how they uh, reach that um, final figure and again it varies significantly from one school to another and from one um, local authority to another but the idea of that is that the school has within its overall budget an amount of money of around six thousand pounds per pupil with SEM which they use to fund the extra support that is needed for that pupil so for example we talked about interventions before so if a child needs an intervention then the funding for that may come out of that um, notional SEM budget they may use that notional SEM budget to pay for additional teaching assistant time etc and that will meet the needs of most children okay including those with SEM but as well as that there is something called the high needs block or high needs funding this is a block of money which is held centrally by the local authority and schools have to usually in most cases have to apply if they need additional funding on top of that notion of six thousand pounds so it's sometimes called top-up funding um, in lots of local authorities and again it, it varies a great deal as to how that works from one la to another um, they usually ask the school to evidence why they need this extra funding so they need to demonstrate what they're already doing what how they've already spent the money and then they need to be able to claim it back from the local authority and it's often quite um quite an involved and arduous process to apply for because the high needs funding blocks for local authorities are under a huge amount of pressure all um, special school placements are actually paid for from that block and we have greater and greater numbers of children in special schools so it there is not any by any means a bottomless pot of money there there is quite a limited amount of money but it does vary greatly from one authority to another how you um, how you go about applying for that and how much money might be made available to you it's more often given to children with education health and care plans but in most local authorities you don't have to have an education health and care plan in order to apply for that funding so if we have a look at how this funding might be spent um, the pure pupil weighting and the SEND notional budget may be spent as the school sees fit, but they must be able to demonstrate that the pupils' needs are being met. Okay. If they have an education, health and care plan, that's obviously laid out within the plan, but for all other children, it's up to the school to demonstrate how they're meeting a pupil's needs through this funding. And it's often spent on teaching assistant time and sometimes extra teacher time but it's possible and it can be more effective to be a little bit more creative because sometimes just having extra teaching assistant isn't actually the the most effective um uh, the most effective resource for that child so it might be and, and more and more schools are doing these things now actually it might be that the school decides to spend some of that budget on speech and language therapy so speech and language therapists employed by the nhs are quite difficult to access they're quite few and far between and their their time is quite thinly spread so lots of schools particularly the bigger um, academies and multi-academy chains are employing their own speech and language therapist and that can be an i think an invaluable use of that budget because for many many children language and communication is one of the main issues that needs developing well, it might be that they, they want to spend it on other forms of therapy so there are schools who spend the money on art therapy or occupational therapy or so on some will um, spend it on funding nurture groups to support children who are having social emotional and mental health difficulties etc or it could be spent on resources such as ict programs so for example there are dyslexia um, programs that you can do on a computer which need um, need buying and, are, and often need licenses paying so that can be bought out of the SEND funding it might be on hardware such as providing laptops or ipads for children with SEND to uh, support them to access the learning better it might be on specialist teaching materials or books games whatever is most appropriate 
to meet children's needs. So more and more schools are spending it on mental health support, perhaps employing um, a counsellor or somebody who, you know, drop comes and, and gives those gives that support to children who are undergoing mental health issues. Some schools will set up things like a sensory room. So they use their SEN funding to um, allocate a room within the school to furnish it, to, to staff it and to enable children to spend time in that sensory room. And it may be that it's often the most important thing to spend the money is actually on training for staff because many children's needs can, can be met quite effectively in the classroom by a teacher who understands what those needs are and understands how to differentiate their teaching to meet those needs. And sometimes that training is needed to, to develop those skills in people. So those, those are just examples. There will be many more. Okay, well, hopefully you would be happy with everything that's um, happening in your school, but if you're not happy, then there are things you can do. I think it's important to always go to the child's class or subject teacher first, or perhaps their form tutor. That's more challenging in a secondary school. I know I have children in the secondary school myself, and, and you, you can feel quite removed from that process. But I think it's always best, if you can, to speak to that person, because they usually know the child best and work with them either all the time or certainly on a regular basis. And hopefully, that's all that's needed to resolve your concerns. Don't feel you've got to wait till parents' evening. They don't come around, you know, a term is quite a long time in a child's life, isn't it? And if they're having a, an issue where you have a concern now and you're not happy with how things are going, don't feel you've got to wait until the next parents' evening, but make an appointment um, with the class or subject teacher, form tutor, or possibly the Senko. If your child um, is already on SEN support, Hopefully you've already got a relationship going with the Senko there and you might want to go um, directly to them. And then hopefully you and the Senko will be able to work together with those class and subject teachers to resolve any issues. If you think they should be on SEM support and they're not, then you would go through the class teacher or the form tutor. If you're still not happy, Maybe if you're not happy with um, perhaps with the Senko or with what they're doing, then you should go to the head teacher. And if that doesn't resolve the issue, you can actually go to the governors and each school, the vast majority of schools have an SEN governor. So they usually have a governor who's responsible for um, overseeing special educational needs and disabilities. And that is your sort of final um, point of call within a school. If your issue still remains unresolved, you can go directly to the local authority to seek um, further advice and support. There are independent bodies. Um, we mentioned Sandias already. There's also IPSI, which is an independent provider of special educational advice, and I've put their um, web address on there for you. They can offer legal advice um, so if you're not happy with what a local authority is doing, you're able to go to them. And as I mentioned earlier, each local authority has a SENDIAS, SCND Independent Information and Advice Service, and you should be able to find your local one um, either on your local authority website or by doing an online search. So, in summary, the SEND Code of Practice is the statutory guidance to which schools and local authorities must have regard. It's, it's, I wouldn't recommend you reading all of it. It's very, very long, but it is available um, online if you, if you do want to do that. You can have a look at it. High quality teaching is the most important factor for everyone, including children with SEND. It's important to always maintain those open communications with the class or the subject teachers. And if your child is identified with SEN, get to know the Senko. They should be able to offer you advice and support. Senkos are very, very committed people. They have the child's best interests at heart. And you should find that you're able to work together with them in, in a team approach to, um, you know, to, to make sure that your child's needs are met as, much, as well as possible. If you don't already know, find out how your child is being supported. 
you should know that already, hopefully, if they've been identified. But if you don't, find out and make sure that this is regularly reviewed. You know, actually say, right, we need to set a date. Sometimes <sighs> Senkos um, are very, very busy people, and it may be that they meant to set the date and then it slipped off the bottom of their list. Keep, keep reminding them, keep making sure that that happens, you know, um, and don't, don't feel bad about that. But if you are dissatisfied, you can go to the head teacher, the governors, or those other sources of advice that we talked about if you're dissatisfied. Okay, there's still time to send in a question if you have one. And I know we've had some through. So if you just give me a moment to read those, I'll see if I can um, answer them. So just bear with me a moment. Okay, so the first question is from Amanda, and she says, what if your child with an EHCP attends an academy but is linked to a state-run or funded SEN unit? Can the academy still do what they like and brush your requests aside? Oh dear, that doesn't sound good. Where do you stand legally? I am confused. Okay, an academy is a state-funded school, so still has to comply with education, health and care plans and the SEND code of practice. OK, so I'm sorry if you've had a bad experience there. That sounds unfortunate. But legally, your child's education, health and care plan is a legal document. So uh, and uh, an academy is still a state funded school. So they still have to meet the um, requirements of that plan. OK. Let me have a look at the next one. OK, this is hopefully a nice, easy one. Nan asks, is there any legislation to refer to about all teachers being teachers of SEND? Yes, it does say that in the SEND code of practice. OK, I couldn't give you the page reference without um, checking, but it, it does it does say that in there. Uh, one from Andrea, should the Senko's role include acting as a gatekeeper for local authorities' SEND budgets? Should they advise parents to delay making an application for EHCP assessment on the basis that not enough of the notional 6K has been spent on, not enough cycles of assess plan due reviews have taken place? Right, okay, that's, mm, yeah, that's an interesting one. And I know that does sometimes happen. I think if, if you've been given that advice, it's probably Yusenko being pragmatic and knowing that if you apply for an assessment and they haven't, they can't evidence how that notional 6K has been spent, that the local authority is likely to simply send it back. So I can understand why Yusenko might be saying that, but actually, my, I'm not a legal specialist, but my understanding is that there is no requirement to go through a particular number of cycles of the assess plan, do and review, and you can uh, that um, assessment can be applied for at any point. Okay, so the local authority will sometimes say you need to have done three cycles of assess plan, do review, etc., and that might be the the criteria that they use. But actually, in the code of practice, you can apply at any point. So it might be worth saying that to the school that you 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 understand that you know the application can be made at any point. Um, and sometimes, if you can, I don't know whether you've contacted the local authority yourself, but they often take much more um, notice when requests come directly from parents. OK, this is from Andrea, who says, what accountability is there in the system for long delays in accessing external specialist advice, such as therapists? Is lack of capacity in the local LA or NHS service an acceptable reason for long delays? Huh, well, that's, I mean, no, <laughs> it's not an acceptable reason, but it's really, really difficult to... Um, to, to pin this one down. It's very rarely the school's fault. It, it has to be about that local authority or as you say, NHS service. And that one of the difficulties with um, the system is that education, health and social care should be working together um, and each pulling their weight within the system. But what tends to happen is that education pulls a lot more of the weight um, and social care and, and health care tend to do less. It can be issues around recruitment, for example. I know there's an issue with recruitment of speech language therapists nationally. 
Um, if you've looked at the um, local area SEND reviews that have happened in lots of local areas, many of them will will draw on this as a criticism. Um, so it's not it's not acceptable, but unfortunately, that sometimes is is simply where we are, which is why lots of schools are now saying, actually, we're not just going to wait for months and months and months to access speech therapy. We're just going to buy some in ourselves or employ a speech therapist ourselves. That's easier said than done for some schools, particularly small schools and primary schools. But this can be one of the positives about multi-academy trusts and that they have those um, economies of scale. So it may be something that, um, you can push for within the school or the um, academy or trust that you that you are involved with. But yeah, it's it's not an acceptable reason. But unfortunately, that is where we're at at the moment. Okay, and just one more. Um, Stacy asks, is it SEND or health funding for one-to-one -one support based on medical needs, e.g. oxygen monitoring or airway control through suction? Right, that's an interesting one. I'm I hold my hands up and say I wouldn't be an expert in this area but that sounds to me as a medical need that it would be health funding because a child with a medical need doesn't necessarily have a special educational need although often they do of course um, but oxygen monitoring or airway control through suction sounds very much like health needs so I would expect it to be health funding but that's the kind of question you might want to go to ipsy with um for a more legal approach because i'm not a legal expert just a teacher okay right that's it for um questions today i hope you found that useful um, there's going to be a short questionnaire at the end of this webinar so please spare um, a couple of minutes to complete that as that helps contact to plan their future events this is going to be made available as a recording, um, I believe within the next week, not the next two weeks, and you should receive an email to let you know um, when that's available. So thank you very much for listening today and I hope you found it useful. Goodbye.